Sound better? Yeah, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna, while we wait for a couple other people to trickle in, I'm gonna put you guys on the spot for just a minute. And if each of you could, 30 seconds, I'll give you 30 seconds to compose your thoughts too, but 30 seconds on who you are, the nature of your project, and what you hope to accomplish. Just like a quick 20 seconds, 30 seconds at a time, okay? So I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it, and then we'll just pass the mic around once. Okay, who wants to start? Got a hand up here first. Hi, um, my name's Allison. Um, I'm on the team of Sigma. Um, our project is Outreach Assistant. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, help community colleges or community college students in California um, gain better access to their education um, and decrease equity gaps in community colleges. Um, and what we're hoping to get out of Big Ideas is more um, customer segmentation um, and really forwarding the process of our recent. Hi, my name is Sahil. I'm on the project Signum. We're hoping to build a video chat platform for people with hearing and speech impairments to bridge the gap in communication for those who are disabled. Um, through Big Ideas, we're hoping to further our market research and, and also encourage our product development. I am Casey Finnerty on uh, Team Heliovap, and Kelly's uh, here with me. Uh, basically, our research, we've been trying to develop these, uh, these materials that efficiently use sunlight to desalinate water. And so what we're trying to use big ideas for is to try and take kind of these uh, innovations we've made in the lab and turn that into an actual technology. And then we're uh, also using kind of user surveys uh, in Indonesia to kind of inform that design. Hello everyone, my name is Caleb. I'm um, an education component um, and part of a team that's creating a diversity, equity, and inclusion score. So just like the US News and Ranking Score, um, the point is to give colleges and universities a ranking system that they can both improve their inclusiveness uh, metrics, um, measure them somehow, and create a sustainable framework um, to measure them in the long run. Um, and hopefully also, um, it'll become important to these universities, kind of like the US News Ranking Score. So uh, we're hoping to kind of use big ideas to lend some credence to it. Um, we've already kind of started working with the College of Engineering there, so we're hoping to get some more background on that. Hey everybody, my name is Jessica and I'm with Sun Biofoods. We're a plant-based alternative meat company and we're trying to make a plant-based chicken that has only five pronounceable ingredients. And what we're hoping to get out of the Big Ideas contest is a lot of help with our uh, customer discovery and market research. And this is my co-founder, Simon. Terrific. Well, thank you, everyone. So this is great. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a small crowd because this year there's only 16. You can turn this one off. There's only 16 Berkeley teams out of 43 in the final round. So we have a number of teams that are tuning in remotely. So on either the live stream or they'll be watching this potentially tomorrow. Um, from Davis, Merced, Irvine, you name it, across the UC system, as well as McCary University in Uganda, where it's, I think, about 4 a.m., so they may not be watching, but if they are, kudos to them. Um, if you are online watching this live and you want to ask questions during this presentation, please email your questions to bigideas at berkeley.edu. That's bigideas at berkeley.edu. We have Mimi, my colleague, who's going to be monitoring Gmail um, and answering those questions or relaying them to me if she can, um, and we'll answer those in real time. There's about a minute delay on the live stream, so we might have to track back a little bit, but we'll keep things moving. So um, the agenda for this evening is we're going to do a quick review of the judging criteria. I went over that in the kickoff, and I think everybody here attended the kickoff. OK, cool. Um, so I went over the criteria in the kickoff, but we'll quickly recap that. Um, I'll go more in depth on each problem section on each component that you need to have in your full proposal application. We'll cover guidelines and provide advice to help you develop your application video, which is another component that you guys have to have ready by, what's the date? Everybody know the date, the deadline? 
March 13th, there we go. March 13th, 1 p.m., we moved it from noon because there was a lot of confusion between 12 p.m. midnight and 12 p.m. noon, so it's 1 p.m., so everybody's clear on that one. Um, and then we're also gonna, throughout this entire presentation, I'm gonna give lots of tips, lots of best practices that we've learned over the last 15 years. I've been running this competition for 10, so I've seen thousands of applications. I know what makes a good application, what makes a bad application, so if you're here tonight, you're gonna get those tips. Um, and please interrupt me at any point if you guys have questions. Um, same goes for our online viewers. Um, just raise your hand, but then allow us like two seconds to bring you a microphone so that your voice can be captured for the live stream. Okay, so moving along. And I may seem like I'm rushing through this a little bit because I did this earlier today as I rehearsed and it was about an hour and a half and I'm gonna try and keep it to about an hour. So if I seem like I'm rushing and you need me to slow down, just tell me to slow down. So 43 teams in the final round, 16 from Berkeley, 19 from the rest of the UC system and eight from McCary University. Um, all of those teams in the final round, you're one big happy family, one big pool. So the big change in between the pre-proposal round and the full proposal round is that you're no longer competing in a category or a track. You're one pool of 43 applicants and the judging review will assess you sort of equally across that. So we're gonna ultimately pick the best 30 innovations out of these 43 and some will get funding of 5,000, some will get funding of 10,000, some will, one will get funding of $15,000, and then we'll have a grand prize winner of $20,000. So 43 teams, 30 award winners, it will be the strongest innovations out of those pools. The elements that we have to develop before March 13th are an eight page written proposal, which we'll go over in a second, as well as a short application video, 60 to 90 seconds. Um, if you go on the website, actually let's go on the website, Everything you ever need to know. And this is is under the compete and then requirements tab. So all the information I'm going to cover tonight, all the nuts and bolts. If you go onto the full proposal application requirements page, you have examples of the application video and the criteria for the application video. You have a written proposal and three examples. And for those of you watching online, you might wanna refer back to these full proposal examples throughout the uh, workshop tonight. Um, the people in the audience here have them, but we have three full proposal examples, past successful full proposal applicants. We have uh, a digest of writing tips that goes over each section of the pro full proposal and gives you tips for each section. Um, and then last but not least, at the very bottom, we have the judging criteria. I should also mention we have the budget template that you're free to use or you, you can create your own budget. We'll go over that tonight as well. We have the judging criteria and frequently asked questions. So this should be sort of your Bible for the final round. Make sure you refer back to it, get to know the material that you're gonna have here very, very well. Um, but everything you need is right there. So I handed out three examples. We have social force, um, this is a web platform that addresses the market gap between local organizations that need resources and small, medium businesses that want to impact their communities. We have another full proposal example, and this is Sonic Eyewear Project, and that's a technology, it's a really cool technology that efficiently trains individuals with visual impairments to navigate the world around them using echolocation like bats. Um, and then we have another project, Dance for All Bodies, and I handed that one out and it's online as well. And this is a therapeutic outlet that uses dance as a vehicle for empowering individuals with limb differences. So one of these is a software platform, one of these is a hardware technology, another one is a service program. So very different types of ideas, very different types of proposals, all big ideas winners. So you can sort of reference which one ever, whichever one sort of matches best with your proposal, with your application, but they're there for you to use. I mentioned the writing tips and the frequently asked questions are on that web page as well. Um, the one thing I want to make really clear though is that make sure you've read those application guidelines very closely. Um, you've come too far to get disqualified at this point when you turn in your full proposal application. And I'm kind of joking when I say that, but it has happened in the past. So just make sure, get, get me to read over your proposal to make sure it's in order before you submit it. We have Mimi, who's a great advisor back there as well. She's been with Big Ideas for the last two years. She's a graduate student in the School of Public Policy. We have other people within the Blum Center and our Big Ideas ecosystem that can also help you out. So make sure you're using us to make sure everything's in order before that March 13th deadline.
Okay. So we do have some upcoming events that you all should be aware about. Um, we will have our industry advising a clinic. Did, it, did anybody go to the industry advising clinic in the first round? Okay, well, it's sold out. We had 50 slots and they went within 24 hours. So if you, as soon as I send out that email probably next week, there's gonna be a rush to sign up and we're gonna have fewer slots this year because we have fewer teams in the final round. So make sure you sign up quickly. Um, you'll get an email about the industry advising clinic and what advisors are gonna be there next week. We have a full proposal editing blitz. This is where myself and other team members from the Blum Center and the Big Ideas ecosystem schedule 45 minute appointments with teams right before the deadline. We're gonna have those on March 9th, 11th, and 12th. We've expanded those because teams I know wanna get, the 13th is the deadline, which is, uh, but we also are gonna do it on the 9th, 11th, and 12th. So make sure you tap into us for advising at the full proposal editing blitz. We're gonna have a legal advising clinic, a le legal entity clinic that we partner with Startup at Berkeley Law on. That will be in late March or early April, date to be determined. And then the date that everybody should have on their calendars, and hopefully you'll be there and you'll be celebrating with us, is our grand prize pitch day and award celebration. The pitch will involve eight of the top teams in this year's competition competing for that $20,000 prize. Um, and the award celebration is an opportunity for all the teams that have competed in this year's competition to come together, demo their products, talk poster their products, and talk to the network of big ideas, potential investors, judges, and mentors, and just sort of expand your networks. And it's a great celebration day and a chance for, to get some exposure for your project as well. And throughout this entire next month, we're about halfway through the full proposal application process right now. Throughout the next month, uh, I have lots of advising hours still open. Uh, Mimi has advising hours on the calendar as well. Others do as well. So you can come meet with us for a 30 minute appointment or book two back to back appointments if there's double slots um, and just get us to sit down, walk through sections of your proposal, um, ask us questions, try and tap into additional networks that you might need for advice. Um, we're here for you over the next, what, 25 days or so. So please use us for anything you can. Um, we are not judges in the competition, so our only goal here is to help you develop that proposal between now and March 13th. Okay, so now let's quickly cover those pre-proposal judging criteria, which we did cover in the kickoff, but we'll go over them again. Um, again, like I said, the big change is that you're no longer competing in a category or track, you're competing as a pool of 43 projects. Um, the main focus in this round of the competition has shifted from that first round, it was all about innovation and creativity, right? Now we're shifting to viability and potential for impact. The goal, the methodology of Big Ideas is we wanna identify the most cutting edge, cool, innovative ideas that students are coming with, up with in that first round and we got 438 projects and we have 43 of the most innovative projects now in the room. And now we wanna work with those 43 projects and help you harness that potential help you harness that energy and turn it into a real strong, viable implementation plan so that hopefully when you get that funding and you've gained some networks and you've developed some additional skills, you've built out your team, you're ready to run with that implementation plan and pilot and prototype or take whatever next steps you're, you need to take to get this thing off the ground. Um, and the other thing is that judges are gonna read about 70 pages worth of proposals. They're each gonna have eight to 10 proposals that they're gonna be reading, so make sure that as you're writing this proposal, make it clear, make it concise, use graphics. Fatigue is a real thing when you're reviewing this many proposals, so white space and graphics and charts and headers and bold and columns really help these types of proposals. So make sure you're doing that as well. That's a, that's a big tip. Um, having read a number of these proposals and having advising sessions back to back to back, even I know that it can get to be tiring um, when you just have a lot of text heavy um, content thrown at you. So, okay. The key things that you're focusing on in this round, viability, that's 30%. What is viability? That is essentially how likely are you to get this thing off the ground? Um, the proposal should demonstrate that you've thought through potential obstacles, risks, and challenges, and that's one of the main areas where students have fallen short and that judges call them out. You gotta be able to know what those challenges would be. Is it gonna be licensing this? Is it gonna be supply chain? Is it gonna be um, regulatory hurdles? Um, know what those risks are, have some sort of strategy to mitigate them or avoid them altogether um, because if you don't identify those risks and challenges and the judges know about them, you're gonna lose them pretty quickly. So risks and challenges and implementation barriers, um, you should consider all relevant aspects of development, consider your marketing goals, marketing strategies, 
uh, realistic training and recruitment procedures for personnel or volunteers. All those things should be in there. You should have identified um, and developed relationships with community partners if possible. Um, if you have letters of support, that's great. If you've identified who you want to partner with, that's okay too. Um, but make sure you know who is out there that you can potentially work with or learn from. Um, and the project um, and team members um, should possess the necessary skills and experience to be successful in implementing the project. The difference between the first round and the second round, and we'll get into the team bios in a, section, in, in, a, in a second, is that in the first round it was okay to say we need to find somebody for X role. In the second round, we really want you to have at least come very close to identifying who that person is, what your strategy is for bringing that person on board. Ideally, you have sort of identified a student or a team member to fill that gap in sort of the skilled skills that your team will need to get this going. Okay? So that's viability. The second component, potential for impact. Again, that's the other big criteria in this round. Um, and this is the proposed project addresses a pressing and important social problem. The team provides the reviewer with sufficient statistics and research to understand the problem and makes a clear and compelling case that their project addresses this need. So with this, I think of it in two different ways, and I think I expressed this a little bit at the kickoff, but there's two kinds of social impact as I think of it. There's sort of the depth argument or the breadth argument. Some projects can be very profound and have a deep impact in a very small or particular region or demographic. Um, for instance, we had Colum Bonke, which was a winner last year in the art and social change category, and they're building appropriate housing for poor income residents in Guinea. And they're working in a specific district, but that community is gonna, they're gonna have a very profound impact within that small community, right? Um, and then there's other projects, like you have the social force example in front of you. And this is a platform that can be scaled and broadly, you know, sent out to a large universe across the globe, potentially. So that has a very broad impact, but potentially not as deep an impact. Whatever the social impact of your project is, make sure you're playing that up. Make sure you're playing up viability and social impact throughout the entire proposal process. Um, that should be front and center on your mind as you're developing your proposal. Um, Okay, and much of this argument will fall, much of your sort of potential for social impact argument will fall within that problem statement section of your proposal. Um, that's where you're gonna be identifying your market size, you're gonna be identifying potential partners and things like that, um, but that's 30% of your proposal. The other four elements, less important but still important, are community and market familiarity. Um, so again, knowing the products, the programs, the services that currently exist and how your program or service or product builds upon or exceeds upon what's already there. Um, that's a really important piece in that landscape analysis, which we'll talk about in a second, has also been, along with sort of identifying risks and challenges, that landscape analysis is the other component that students often fail on and judges call them out. If you haven't done a thorough landscape research and the judges notice that and know one of your competitors that you haven't identified, again, it's a quick way to lose them. So make sure you do a thorough landscape research and you know the community that you're gonna be working in and you can tie experience or knowledge of that community into your proposal. Um, measuring a realistic budget, we'll go really over the budget in a minute but that's 10%, it should be really well scoped out. You should have sort of cited where you're getting your costs from, both revenues and uh, expenses. The maximum you can request is $10,000, but your budget can be much larger if you have additional revenue sources that you might be able to tap into. It doesn't need to be money in hand at this point, just perspective. Um, and then measuring success. This is not a thorough M&E report, we'll go over this in a minute too, but it's really um, what are the metrics that you'll be gathering how will you be gathering them? What objectives are they trying to sort of help you understand to know if your project is progressing as planned or if you need to pivot or rethink a strategy, but what metrics and sort of how will you measure that success? And then last but not least is quality and creativity. And the best way to describe this is that it's really the judge's wiggle room um, to step back after they've read your whole proposal, after they sort of graded you on all these other components to say, do I really believe this? Am I really, excited by this idea, do I think it's one of the top ideas? And they're gonna sort of be looking at this. It's not quality in terms of have you dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. It's more like a step back to say, is this a really strong proposal and do I have faith in it, okay? Any questions on that? I went through that really quickly, but we have covered it in the kickoff. We're all good? Oh, can we get a, sorry, microphone.
mentioned letters of support earlier. Is that something you'd want us to include in our proposal or just mention that we have? So one of the big differences in this round is that you can have appendices. So it's great if you have a letter of support from a partner or an organization to put that in the appendices and reference it in the main body of your proposal when you're talking about your community partnerships. Thank you. Yep. So, and that's a key thing is that you can have appendices, as many as you want, but judges are only instructed to read eight pages. So they will only go back there if there's something to your appendices, if there's something referencing it up front in those eight pages. So make sure everything in the appendices is tied to your eight pages, okay? Okay, rules overview. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset, 43 teams, we're gonna be giving out 30 awards. There's essentially four different tiers of awards. We will have Big Ideas Award winners, we will have grand prize finalists, and then we will have a grand prize runner up, and then we will have a grand prize, okay? So we essentially, that means there will be about 22 Big Ideas Awards of $5,000 as a minimum award there. We're gonna advance eight teams out of the 30 into the grand prize pitch. Those will be the top eight teams, those are sort of our big ideas, and those eight teams will compete. They'll all get $10,000. Um, and then they will compete for either the runner-up prize, which is $15,000, or the top prize, which is $20,000. That's total. Okay? So does that make sense? I didn't explain it well at the kickoff. I have it down now. That was the first time. Okay? Um, the written proposal, eight pages max. Appendices and references are allowed and do not count towards the page limit. Um, you can put anything back there you want. Again, just reference it up in the first eight pages. The font, the formatting are flexible. You can use images and charts. I encourage you to use images and charts and graphs to break it up. Um, the only thing we ask, and we'll be kind of sticklers about it, is that you don't squeeze the font, you don't squeeze the margins, don't try and fit 20 pages into eight pages. Um, use 11 or 12 font point font. Use a standard font um, in one inch margins. Uh, the application video is the other component, 60 to 90 seconds max. Um, we'll be sticklers about the time too. Um, and then you will upload your written proposal in one document as a PDF. You will upload your application video to YouTube and then on the application platform there's a place to put in the URL from YouTube. And if you want to hide that from other viewers, you can check the privacy settings on YouTube um, and that's fine too. Um, the application link for applying, I'm going to send that out to you on March 2nd is my goal there. I don't want to give it to you yet because I want you to be thinking about the application, not uploading the application yet. I want you to use all this time. Um, so you will have that on March 2nd. So that's two weeks to go in and start filling out the form. And that web form is going to be pre-populated with all the things you had in your pre-proposal so that you can edit it. You can edit your team members if the team membership has changed. You can edit the project description if you want to update it. Everything can be changed, but it will be pre-populated with all the pre-proposal stuff that you submitted in the first round other than the PDF. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Okay, okay so now we're gonna go into in depth each proposal element um, for the written proposal. Uh, so this shows sort of the viability and the impact throughout all of these sections should be the stress. Um, final. Te finalist teams will have the opportunity to develop these and refine these proposals, your pre-proposal into full proposals due March 13th. Um, and the goal for this is to expand on the ideas you pre presented in your pre-proposal, um, edit your proposal based on the judging feedback, and that feedback should be something you're, you've already gone through, you already have consolidated. Not with the feedback, I like to say, you don't need to take every piece of criticism or constructive feedback into account in the final proposal. What you're doing when you go through that feedback is looking for the commonalities, right? You're looking at four or five or six judges and trying to see, okay, what were the major sort of commonalities in the feedback that I need to address because those were the big questions. If there's a couple other questions that either are in conflict with one another, it's perfectly fine to ignore those, but use that judging feedback. Um, and just general tips for the full proposal before we dive into these elements. Number one, know your audience, right? Uh, these are judges who are giving their time, volunteering their time to review your proposals, busy professionals. So let me throw it on you guys. Why do you think they're doing that? What is the motivation for the judges? Anybody? I'll, re I'll repeat it. Well, go ahead. They probably uh, care about student development um, and their special impact on citizenship, which is likely some of them have to speak for angels in the community and they want to advance their careers. Yeah. 
Yep, they care about projects that have social impact. They care about you know, sort of student development. Those are two key reasons. Anything else we want to throw out there? I'll throw out a couple. They want to give back, right? They want to give back to their community. Some, some of these are often alums. Um, they want to give back because they had a great mentorship experience themselves or they had got great feedback at some point in their life. Um, they want to get inspired by your ideas. That's the other thing we hear from judges all the time, that they get inspiration. You know, they've been working in industry for 30 years and seeing these new ideas coming out of, you know, the minds of university students at some of the best universities in the country inspires them and makes them work harder. So I think, you know, that's what you're trying to convey in your proposals is that energy, that passion, that commitment, um, and you know, that's part of knowing your audience and writing to that audience. Um, we talked about using your pre-proposal feedback. Um, play to the competition. Know what Big Ideas is. Um, big Ideas in the final round is about viability and impact. Big Ideas is about social impact. It's not a business plan competition. A lot of problems with some of the applications we get from business school students is that they focus on the financial metrics rather than the social impact, right? This is not a business plan competition. We care more about how you're going to improve the world than how you're going to make gobs of money for yourself. So keep that in mind as you're developing your application as well. Um, know yourself, know your project, um, focus on the key attributes of your project and stick to that. Um, know sort of your key value proposition, I hate that word, but you know your key value proposition. Don't get lost and confused and don't get the judges lost and confused by throwing in the kitchen sink at your proposal, trying to fine tune every detail, show all the possibilities for what this technology or service could potentially end up doing. Sort of get to your core argument, sometimes less is more, and stick to that argument. That's another piece of advice. Um, and then eight pages is not a lot of real estate. Um, you might think it is going from three pages to eight pages, but we have a number of different elements. It's really going from like three to five pages. Um, so every section, every sentence, every word should have value, add value to your proposal. Um, so make sure it does. If it doesn't, um, get rid of it. Sometimes it's good to have redundancy to emphasize key points, but if it's overly redundant, get rid of it um, and find another way to add value to your proposal. Okay. So digging into the sections. So the first section is somewhat optional. In the web form, you guys might remember you had to put together a 150 word summary. When you actually are developing your application, sometimes it's good to put that summary or a version of that summary right up front and center to give the reader context before they dive into each element of your proposal. Um, if you look at all three examples that you have, um, each one of those did that and did it successfully just so that the reader diving in, if they haven't read closely the summary from the web form, they can see that right at the top of your proposal and it gives them that context. Um, tips here, if you have a non-intuitive venture name, if it's based on some Latin word or if it doesn't immediately convey what it needs to convey about your project, explain it. Um, we had one project a few years ago called SOMO Project, which in Swahili means to learn lessons. It was an entrepreneurship program in the slums of Kibera. Um, so just having that one-liner SOMO project, SOMO means to learn lessons, helped sort of identify and ground that project a little bit more. Um, and then the other thing you can do in that summary statement is add a hook. If you guys have a personal experience or an anecdote or something that shows how connected you are to this problem, to the solution, to this challenge, you should have that in that section. Um, it's a good way to just let the judges know immediately that you are vested in this, you feel this, and you're going to be passionate about implementing this project. Okay. Then we move on to the problem statement. And I, as I said previously, this problem statement plays directly into your social impact argument, which is your 30%. So you can't spend enough time really honing this section of your proposal. Um, so it's great if you originally had a lot more in this section for your pre-proposal, um, and then you had to cut down. That's what a lot of teams in my advising sessions, we had to go through the problem statement and decide what to cut out. Now you can add a lot of that back in. Um, you should really fall in love with the problem, understand the problem, uh, show the reader that you know what you're talking about. Um, you should have, this section should include a clear description and background information on the identified problem. An effective statement is thoroughly researched, shows a deep understanding and builds a strong case to support why the project is needed. Use really relevant and strong research statistics, um, citations. I think in the kickoff I didn't, I was asked a question about what makes um, a reference or a citation strong. You, 
and I didn't have a really good answer for that because you kind of know it when you see it, right? If it's an academic peer-reviewed article or if it's something from the NIH, uh, that's better than having something, a quote from a community health worker in the Wall Street Journal. So just source your information, try and find the strongest sources for your information um, to back up your problem statement. Um, take into account any ethical, cultural, legal considerations that might be part of your problem. That's another key point there. That shows your connection to the community and your understanding of the community you want to serve. Um, and just really try and hone in on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, this section is very long, usually. It's usually about a page and a half, two pages. And I've seen a lot of really text-heavy, dense sections for the problem statement. So call out using bold and underline or graphics um, some of the key terms in your problem statement. Uh, you can use interviews, case studies, customer discovery. Um, for revenue generating ventures, talk about your market size. That goes into your problem statement here. Basically what the judges are trying to figure out in this section is how big your problem is and they're going to be skeptical if you make claims about the problem without backing them up. So that's where the citations come in. We talked about the strong, credible, recent citations. Use those. Um, and then if you can convince the judges that you have a clear understanding or connection to the community, that's a really good idea. Um, again, it can be in that summary statement, but it can also be in the problem statement. If you look for at the Dance for All Bodies application that's in front of you and that's on our website, um, in the very first paragraph of the Dance for All Bodies problem statement, they talk about how Yagmer, um, how, how she was, uh, had worked at San Francisco uh, General Hospital, the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, how she worked with the functional limb service team. So immediately to the judge that says, okay, this person was entering, they were committed to that community already, they're passionate about what they do, they wanna make a difference. That's automatic credibility in terms of, you know, wanting to take this thing forward and having that really, that drive, that energy to do something. So make those types of connections if you can in your problem statement. Okay, any questions about the problem statement? No? Okay, we'll keep moving through. Okay, and existing solutions. So this is sort of your landscape analysis, and many of you did these types of landscape analysis before, um, but this should be an overview of any existing services, programs, interventions that have taken place before yours that are similar, similar to yours, and how your program, service, or technology builds upon or exceeds upon what's already there. Um, it's okay if you're building off something somebody did before you. You don't have to be original and unique to be innovative. Okay, so um, keep that in mind as you're, as you're building these things. The two types, most common types of sort of landscape analyses that we see in terms of graphs are the two by two matrix. This is one for Airbnb when they first came out, um, which shows sort of on the scale um, affordability and online transactions that Airbnb was one of the most affordable and one of the easiest to use in terms of you could make your transactions online. So very quick and clear way to show who are the competitors, where does your value proposition or where does your value lie within that field. Everybody's good on that one? These are ones you've probably seen before, maybe included in your pre-proposal. The other one is the competitive feature matrix where you sort of talk about everything that yours does well and the shortcomings of the other technologies or services that are similar to yours. Um, so this is just a great way to, you know, very quickly and easily convince the judges that you've done some landscape research, you know who those competitors are, and here's why ours exceeds what's already there, because we have all these great check boxes and everybody else is missing a few. Simple as that. Okay. So tips for this section. Um, for the, for the landscape analysis section. Um, if there's a key, and I mentioned this before, if there's a key player in, the, in your market, in your community that you haven't identified, that's the quickest way to lose a judge. So make sure you've done that thorough landscape analysis. Um, the other thing is if there's a lack, if there's a lack of, of players or competitors or you know, other people who are working in the same space, for me, that raises even more questions. Is there a market? Is there a need? You know, so you gotta, you gotta kind of walk that balance, right? You wanna have competitors to show that there is a need, but um, you also wanna make sure that uh, you're not, or that you're comparing yourself in well against them, I guess. Okay, questions about that section? We'll keep moving through. There we go. Can we get a microphone? Sorry about that. Hi, 
and for the landscape analysis section, um, analysis section, would it be better to focus on visuals over text? Like if we have our section almost entirely a two by two matrix, would that be more effective? Good question. I should I should have talked about that. So I think in all of these sections, um, measuring success, landscape analysis, and budget, those three sections in particular, it's good to have the charts, the graphics, with a little bit of a narrative to go with it, space permitting. You know, if you if you think it conveys enough and you don't need that text and it's just taking up space, don't use it. But I think a little bit of text, a little bit of narrative does help in those three se sections specifically. Yep. Yep. Good question. Really good question. I should have mentioned that. Okay. Proposed innovation. So um, with this proposal that you're writing now, you're not competing again in a track or a category. So you are writing to a generalist audience. Assume they, if you're working on an energy technology, um, don't assume they have an energy background. You're writing to people from all different sectors, people with startup experience, you know, people with, you know, MBAs and out there and you're working venture capitalists, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So it could be anybody from any sector is what I'm trying to say. So write to that generalist audience. Um, the proposed innovation section is really the summary of your innovative project. What is your program service or good? How does it work? What is its intended impact? Um, this is really the nuts and the bolts. Ooh, we have a question from online, our first online question. I want to hear this one. And it might be a slide or two back. That's right, and I apologize. As well. <laughs> I also am probably not on camera, but hopefully people can hear me. The question is, when writing the problem statement, Philip mentioned putting in the market size. Should this be a market size evaluation? as if it were a business market sizing or a market size as in how big the problem is and how the idea can make an impact? I would say it's much more the latter. Um, again, going back to that, what I was saying about some of the business proposals that we've seen in Big Ideas, we're looking more about the social impact and about the population that you want to serve uh, or that you can potentially serve, I should say. So it would be the latter of those two, th two pieces. It's not necessarily the financial metrics and the market size, it's more about the scope of the problem and the people you can potentially impact with your solution, okay? Okay, so proposed innovation. Um, so we want to focus on what this project looks like. As I said, it's your nuts and bolts in the first year of implementation. And we're defining that first year of implementation as June of 2020 to June of 2021. And that's because we anticipate that Big Ideas Awards will be dispersed around June, maybe July, but hopefully June. Um, and so that's when you have this one-year runway to get this project off the ground. So focus on that one-year timeline. If you've done work leading up to this timeline, it's perfectly okay to say all those things that you've done and all the progress you've made to date very briefly. Um, it's okay if you have a broader vision beyond that one year for scaling this. Most projects will take longer to scale. Um, but really, this entire proposal is that implementation plan for the first year. So focus predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly on that first year, June 2020 to June 2021. Um, okay, potential challenges it should talk about. Um, have you encountered any since the pre-proposal or in the first year? Do you intend to encounter any in the first year of implementation? This can sometimes be a section on its own. We've talked about risks and challenges and obstacles. Um, you can include diagrams. If you have diagrams of a prototype, it can be a wireframe or a mock-up. Um, it should have some sort of evolution about what key events have shaped your innovation and how does this affect your viability potentially. Um, it also, in a lot of cases, covers sort of your theory of change, how you're going to build this and how it will impact the community and what, how those systems and services play within that community to get the outcomes, the desired outcomes you want to see. Um, so really kind of go into that theory of change mindset and try and figure that piece of your project out and convey it well in the proposed innovation section. And then the proposed innovation can also reference those key partners, um, community leaders that you might be working with, individuals, um, or potentially your mentors that you're working with and how they're playing into your project. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and this is a section where it comes up the most, don't shy away from those potential challenges or those obstacles. Don't avoid talking about them. Really talk as a team about how you can mitigate them or avoid them altogether. Um, and include that sort of reasoning in your proposal. It's much better to do that um, or to say that you're going to be working on it over the course of the next year as you're developing this rather than ignore it. Um, this section and those risks and challenges play directly into that viability component. Question. 
with regards to the discussion about uh, anticipated challenges, what section do you see that being most fitted into? Okay, well, two comments to that. It, I've seen it in many different sections, and while I'm laying out you know, all of these different eight sections or so, it's your story to tell. You can intermingle these sections. You can, you know, it doesn't have to be proposed innovation section, landscape analysis section, st summary section. It can be interwoven if, if that's a better story for you to tell. So the short answer is it can be any place, but it should be somewhere within your proposal. Yep. Okay. Other tips for the proposed innovation section and also kind of in general is avoid the startup jargon. Um, Again, not a business plan competition. Explain your key concepts and the characteristics of your, or the features of your innovation very clearly. Um, there's a really fine balance in terms of conveying enough technical information so that the reader believes you have the technical understanding of how to develop this project, especially for highly technical projects, HelioVet perhaps. Um, but also being able to deconstruct those um, for sort of the layman. I have a political science, I'm a political science major. I should be able to understand how you're thinking through that technology as well. So using the technical jargon so they know you have that understanding, but also breaking it down so that anybody can understand it. That's a really key skill in writing these types of proposals. Um, and then bottom line, the one key question that judges will have in their back of their minds as they read this proposed innovation section is, how will they do this? So as you're writing that proposed innovation section, keep thinking, have I explained how I'm doing this? Is it gonna be easy for the judge to answer that question in their own minds? It's your job to convince them that you have the technical understanding, the partnerships, the resources, most importantly, the vision and the strategy to get this thing off the ground. That's the key for the proposed innovation section. Questions on that? Okay. We went through all these. Oh, so for highly technical projects, it's really useful so often to have diagrams. This was a project called Pika Pen, which was a pen that helped people with motor hand disabilities um, learn to write more effectively. Um, and describing it was hard in text, but just using a simple diagram like this that took up you know a quarter of a page was really powerful because quickly, you grasp all the components that went into this, how well thought out the design was. Um, so for highly technical projects, I definitely encourage you to use those wireframes or graphs or um, renderings of the technology itself, okay? Evolution we talked about, we talked about theory of change, goals and objectives, and partners. Main sections, right? Okay, implementation timeline. Um, another piece that you did have in your last proposal, um, but this one, actually no, this wasn't in your last proposal, but you're gonna augment on this this time. So the timeline describes the key next steps for implementing the idea for the first year of implementation only. So again, June 2020 to June 2021. Um, and and uh, teams may mention the work conducted prior to that, like I mentioned, or after, but really focus in on that one year time frame. This can be a Gantt chart. Um, it can be, you know, just a, text diatribe of what you're gonna do step by step, but it should be really well thought out. Um, so if you go into some of the examples that you have in front of you, Social Force did an excellent job in terms of their implementation timeline. Um, they really focused on the four key phases. So that's something, so each project has a phase, right? So they focused on outreach, they focused on development, execution and evaluation. Those were the four key phases over their one year time frame. Um, I think it's on page 12 of the social force pr uh, proposal. Um, but then they broke down each one of those phases and goals or tasks that they need to accomplish within each phase. So that I thought was a really effective um, implementation timeline. Dance for All Bodies had a good Gantt style chart in their proposal. That one is on page six for Dance for All Bodies. Um, really well laid out, very well thought through. Um, and you can check that one out as well. I like that one. So I included this. That's one of the reasons I included that proposal. Sonic Eyewear Project, not necessarily as strong, but I really liked how in addition to the timeline, and this is on page five of the Sonic Eyewear Project proposal. On page five, they clearly called out their top three objectives. I thought that was a really sort of cool value add to 
an implementation timeline argument. Their implementation timeline was in another section, but by calling out those three top objectives, I thought that helped their case a little bit. Even though their, their implementation timeline in the earlier section was a little bit weaker, that helped. Okay? So with your implementation timeline, tips. Avoid laundry lists. Um, core aspects of your proposal, core phases, core um, roles and, and tasks that you'll be accomplishing over the year. Don't get too far into the minutia or you'll run out of space. Um, and be really strategic about it. Um, make sure you're not overwhelming the reader with highly technical charts and too much information. Um, if there's a lot of complexity to your timeline, and this goes back to your question, um, use that narrative that helps your timeline flow, um, either above or below. Um, focus on value statements. The judges are going to be reading through your implementation plan with, e with each step, and they're going to be thinking, I wonder why they chose to do it this way. Like, why, why is this the right pathway to help you guys scale your project and get off the ground? Um, so when you're describing a step, help the ju judges understand why it's important, what value it's going to add to your project. Um, and these steps might seem really obvious to you, but this is the first time the judges have thought about it. So you've got to explain it really clearly. OK? So strategic and clear. OK. Measuring success, and let me just do a time check. 622, we're doing OK. So measuring success, another new section um, for this full proposal application. So in this section, um, it's really how can you measure your impact for your project. It's not a blown out. I don't know if anybody's familiar with sort of the formal monitoring and evaluation reports that can take years um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're not looking for that. We are looking for how will you know if your project is going as planned? What are the metrics you're going to be tracking to make sure that you're building this and growing this or that you have to begin to rethink because things aren't going the right way? So what are those metrics? Um, again, focus the, your measuring success section on that first year of implementation. Um, so, and this is different for different projects. It really looks different, different for different types of projects. For a venture that has a revenue stream, this could be financials, it could be sales, marketing. Um, for an app that, you know, for an app or a, or a software program, it could be downloads, um, use, it could be a lot of those analytics that you track on websites, shares, interactions, particip participants. For community development projects, or for service programs in the Berkeley area, it could be the number of you know, attendees. Um, it could be how many events you're having in a given month or a given year. So different metrics for different projects. There's no one right way. Think about what's best for your project. Um, you can map your theory of change. You can look at the impact you intend to have. What indicators will let you know you're moving forward in that direction? We already talked about that. Short-term and long-term metrics are great so that they know you have both sort of the short-term goals, but also the long-term vision. Um, social force, so we'll turn to page 13 in social force. Um, they list their goals strongly up front. Um, they say social force aims to bring in five to seven mission-driven SMEs and 20 to 25 community organizations during their first six months. So boom, right out of the bat, you know their big overview objective goals. Um, and then they dive into there are four phases, or out, there are four phases. They, they dive into their outcomes, their indicators, their measurement instruments. So this is really cool. I, I actually have it in here so you can see. So a good monitoring and evaluation, evaluation plan really covers three key areas. It covers sort of the key outcomes. What are your, what are, what are not necessarily the goals, but the outcomes that you're looking to get out of this project? What are the indicators that you will be collecting to sort of begin to assess those outcomes? And how are you going to collect those? So for instance, improved employee engagement and customer recognition. That's their outcome. What are you going to track? Total number of volunteers, number of volunteer hours, self-reported ratings, and how are you going to collect them? They're going to do a feedback survey upon signups and then periodically um, trend and survey people again. And they're going to track the platform analytics for volunteering data. So pretty clear, right? That's one key objective. And they clearly laid out how they're going to assess that and how they're going to gather it. That's a, that's a great chart, I think. Um, Dance for All Bodies also has something similar to this. Um, I don't have the page number here. But they highlighted and grouped key outcomes. Actually, it's on page 7. Um, attached with indicators they wanted to measure, and finally, how they would measure those indicators. So very similar to what Social Force did, but slightly, slightly more condensed, I'd say. Okay. 
So the keys for this section, the tips I give you is help the judge understand where your metrics of success came from. Make sure they clearly understand. If you're trying to improve test scores by 30%, for instance, let, help them understand why you chose 30%. Why not 50%? Why not 20%? Don't just say we're going to do this at 30%. Um, so let them know and give them clarity on why you're selecting the metrics that you've chosen um, and uh, convey that rationale. And judges are looking for a realistic plan to measure your success. In global health, for instance, the gold standard is randomized control trials, but these can take years. They can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So find the most appropriate cost-effective metric system you can for your particular project, okay? Be realistic. Any questions on that? We often get questions on the measuring success section. But it's pretty clear? Yeah? Okay, keep going. We'll get to the good stuff or the fun stuff too in the application video in a minute. Okay. Budget. So the maximum teams can request from big ideas is $10,000. Okay. Even though we've raised the pro top prize to $20,000, um, we want you to stick to that $10,000 budget limit. But we do understand that many projects take much more than that to get off the ground. So that's perfectly fine. And in this stage, because these are still early stage ventures, in most cases, in all cases they should be, um, it's okay to have projected revenue, um, projected funding sources, grants you may be applying to, crowdfunding campaigns you may be um, launching over the course of the next year. Um, you can have a revenue section, you can have your uh, expenditure section, um, and you can request $10,000 for big ideas, but these should all then align to some degree. Does that make sense? We have a budget template online. I showed you where it was earlier. It's under bigideascontest.org backslash rules. You can go on that. You can use our budget template. I recommend it just because that's what the judges are most used to seeing, so they understand it when they get to it. If you're going to do your own budget, just make sure it's very clear um, how you're laying out those expenditures, how you're laying out the revenue, any projected budget gap you may have. Um, so, so, sort of buyer beware. If you don't use our spreadsheet, make sure yours is very, very clear. Um, think through all of the reasonable costs for that first year. Again, first year timeline. Um, justify the costs with a budget narrative if you need to. Cite where you're getting those costs from always helps. If you're citing an airfare or if you're citing lab equipment, where are you getting those quotes from? Um, you know, be very, and make sure with airfare, that you're citing it for the appropriate season and travel time that you're gonna be going, things like that. Just make sure it's very clear so that there's no holes that the judges can sort of pick on. Um, and what else? Uh, we talked about the $10,000 budget list. Um, that's about it. Um, the budget's a really good thing to come in for an advising session with me to go through to see if you know I have questions if we need to add clarity to the budgets. So use that for an advising session if you need to too. Often we have questions there. Okay, keep going through. And last but not least, team bios. So in this round, again, we know these are early stage ventures. It's perfectly fine to add team members, drop team members, add new partners, drop, drop partners. Um, we know that these things fluctuate as projects build. So in the team bio section, you should have very brief biographies explaining the relevant skills to the role that person will have on the project. Identify each person's role on that particular project um, and cite their relevant experience. Um, and just much like the pre-proposal, just keep it very clear and concise um, tied to the project itself. Don't be talking about, you know, that they're part of the jazz quartet if it doesn't apply to the project. Just keep it very focused and narrow. Okay. Any questions on that? Those are the pre-proposal elements. Did I explain them in depth enough? Do you all know what's going into it? Does everybody up there know? Any questions online? Okay, cool. Um, now we're gonna dive into the other section of the pre-proposal. That was 30 minutes. Um, and that is, sure, everybody? I have a question for questions, anybody? Okay. Um, application video instructions. Um, we're gonna dive into this now. So this is a 60 to 90 second elevator pitch. So think as if you were meeting a venture capitalist or a potential partner, potential funder in a hallway or in an elevator. 
um, and what you would say to them if you had 60 to 90 seconds. Um, these should be student team members only. Um, they should be direct to the camera. Um, it's as if you are speaking directly to the judge. Um, zero effects. We want this to be you and you alone, your team members, you and your team alone talking to the judges. Um, no cuts, no images, no images, no demos, no props, nothing like that. Um, it's you and your words. No music. Um, and I recommend, although it's hard and I know you probably will, no script or at least very loosely scripted. You want this to be conversational. You don't want it to be stilted and uh, What's the word I'm looking for? What's the word I'm looking for, Mimi? Stilted or stiff or, you know, you just want it to be conversational. Um, scripted, thank you. That's the word. Okay, rigid. Any others? Rigid, scripted. <laughs> okay, um, so in the common, this is basically what this is, is a mini application, right? So it has almost everything that you would have in your pre-proposal, all those elements we talked about in a very abridged way in a, in a narrative. So who is your team? Who is your, what is your company about? What is the problem you're gonna try and solve? What is your proposed innovation and how does it add value to that landscape? Um, maybe you get into a competitive analysis, although that's hard in a 60 to 90 second video. And then what is that sort of broad vision you have for making an impact on society, changing the world, and what is that sort of vision you're gonna have going forward? Sort of, those are the key things. And what you're trying to do with this application video, because it's gonna be the first thing the judges see, is really excite them. Convey your passion, your commitment. You want them to read your application really thoroughly. So this is your chance to go face to face with the judges, or at least their, your face to them, um, and say, you know, an exciting story about your project and why you're gonna have this tremendous impact on society. And if you can do that, if you convey your energy, your passion, your innovation, the judges are more likely to like take that energy as they open your proposal. So that's your job with this video is like, bring it. Got a question now. Just to clarify, the judges, in terms of like the order in which they see the materials, will see the video first, and then they will see the uh, written proposal? So the way they're gonna go into your proposal is they go into their, our judging platform, and they're gonna see your project name, 150 word summary, and a little screenshot of your video that they can click play on. Um, above that is uh, the tab for the proposal that they can click on. So they could open it up and go straight to the tab, but most judges are gonna read the summary, the 150 word summary, click on the video, watch the video, go into your proposal, that's 90% of the judges or more are gonna do it that way. So this is your chance to bring them in, okay? Yeah, uh, another clar clarification. Uh, when you say students team only has to be featured in the video, um, if there's a member, like let's say an alumni member, should not be included in the video, is that correct? So it's a bit of a gray area. I would recommend you use student team members. Last year, one of the examples, I'll sh actually it's not here, but it's online, it's Colin Bonke. It's one of the three examples on the rules page. They had a person who had graduated the previous year who was still part of the project and they were part of the pitch video. We want this to be students talking to the camera. We don't want, what I don't want is, you know, a community partner or a testimonial or something like that. Um, but if it's somebody who is recent student, one or two years out, who's actively involved in the project, we'll let that fly. Um, but it really should be the student team talking to the camera, okay? So now we're gonna watch a couple and then we're gonna just brainstorm what we like, what we don't like about them. Sound like a plan? Okay. Hey there, big ideas. My name is Matt. I'm Alvina. And I'm Gideon. And we're here to talk to you about the Isochoric Organ Preservation Project. So in the United States, 20 people die every day waiting for an organ transplant. The organ transplant waiting list is 114,000 people long, and every 10 minutes, another person is added to that list. With only 10% of the global need for organ transplantation being met, many of the people will die waiting there. Currently, five out of eight donor organs goes to waste simply because we have no way of preserving the organs outside of the body long enough for a match to be found and a transplantation surgery to be performed. 
And so the reason that preserving these organs outside the body is so tricky is that you have to hold them at temperatures well below freezing, but ice formation will destroy them. And so we have this sort of fundamental limitation that has prevented solutions from penetrating this space. And that's where we come in with our proposed solution of isochoric preservation system. And so we're applying novel new thermodynamics that were developed in our lab here at Berkeley to build a solid state, passively cooled device that suppresses ice formation and enables 72 hour preservation of organs. It is estimated that if we can remove the supply constraints associated with organ transplantation, we can prevent 30% of all deaths in the United States. We firmly believe that our technology has the potential to save thousands of lives and improve millions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thoughts, comments? What do you think? Pros and cons. What was good about it? The passion? The energy, right? Especially the, the guy on the right there. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a salesman. He's a born salesman, right? So that's his style, which is cool. He can do that. I can't, I'm not a salesman. I can't do what he does. But so you got to be true to who you are and true to your own voice. But if you can sell like him, do it. Some people see him though and say, you know, too much of a salesman. So maybe moderate it. Any others? saw kind of like a range of communication with regards to like scripted versus conversational. Yeah. And I think because there was such a difference between the team members, it kind of like you had to like get on different levels to kind of like understand what they were saying. Yeah. And so I think kind of matching the energy or even like equalizing the energy uh, would help kind of keep you engaged the whole time. Yep. Yep. I, I kind of I, I agree. But I also kind of like that. You know, Gideon seems like a more technical guy and quieter. Uh, Alvina is more like the moderator, and then Matt is like the salesman. So it's kind of a good balance of personalities, too, within the project. So I guess it could go either way. Yeah. Any other things, good or bad? I mean, the things I liked out of this was they clearly laid out their value proposition, right? When, when Matt was talking about this solid state passively cool, and he was using like those terms that really differentiate their solution. And then they ended up really strong where um, Gideon was talking about saving 30,000 lives um, and, and, and Alvina talking about how they could potentially save thousands upon thousands of lives at the end. So their social impact, you know, was loud at the end, which I really liked. Okay. Any other comments, questions about that one? This project was a winner in the Hardware for Good category last year and a grand prize finalist. Okay, I really like this one too. I shouldn't preface it though. It's been two seconds and you've already made a snap impression of us. And that's unconscious bias, unintended discrimination that stems from stereotypes. I'm Kat and I'm a mycologist. And I'm Emily and I'm an ecologist. Since the bias is unconscious, it's really hard to get people to recognize it and then stop it. As female scientists, we, we know. know. Which is why we founded the Unconscious Bias Project, giving evidence-based workshops to help people tackle bias. But these workshops work best when they're voluntary. So how do we appeal to the naysayers at Cal? We will flood the UC Berkeley campus with art and artfully designed objects that get the skeptics thinking about bias. Art can move us when facts just don't. This art and these objects are gonna be connected through three different design principles, humor, simplicity, and practicality in everyday life. One big idea is to take our cartoons showing how bias can manifest in everyday conversations and make them bigger then display them around campus in interactive exhibits. We're also gonna make pop sockets and decoder rings and even a laser yarn simulation, like Mission Impossible. And you can check that all out at our website, unconsciousbiasproject.org. We will track our impact with surveys, hits on our website, and our social media. Unconscious bias is a habit, and just like any other habit, it can be broken. First at Cal, and then the world. So I, I thought that uh, video had a perfect, like I think in terms of spelling bees when they teach us in elementary school, say it, spell it, say it. So it said what their thing was at the beginning and they ended with it. And that was very, that's always very good yep. um, in understanding a proposition. And their energy was just very good, obviously. Their, their dynamic together was very good. 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the key things that you're trying to get across is if you do it as a team and rather than a sole individual is that chemistry. Judge, judges, reviewers want to sense that chemistry. They have great chemistry. You know right off the bat. The last team had great chemistry too, um, but this one, it pops off the screen. Um, and I also like what you're saying, which is they opened strong. Um, they had a little bit of a hook at the beginning with that thing going, and then they ended with their tagline, sort of, you know, unconscious bias can be broken. Um, so they had a good start and a good ending, and that's another thing that people sort of overlook um, is the how do you end these videos. Um, end it with that strong statement um, like they did. Good job. Um, any others? Yeah, I really liked their incitement and how they opened the video. I think one area of improvement would be about their scalability. At the very end, they mentioned like first Cal in the world, but maybe a sentence or, t sentence or two about how they're going to apply this beyond Berkeley would have been really helpful. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I also think that you're going to realize how quickly 60 or 90 seconds goes by. You're not going to have time for that extra set sentence, but maybe that's what they ran into. But if they could add that in, it would be great. OK, anything else? The other things I liked about this is, and this was my question to them when they came into m advising with me, because I'm not one who would probably go to an unconscious bias seminar or something like that. Um, but they talked about how they would break through, to, you know, break you know, their preaching to the choir is the argument. Um, how they would break through to non-traditional audiences and talk to the risk takers or the naysayers um, and build this out beyond sort of the natural audience for it. Um, I also liked how they cited their examples of the types of events or simulations they would put people through and comparing it to Mission Impossible, which everybody kind of thinks is cool. So a fun and lively one. Any, any other comments, questions on this one? We'll move to another one. Okay. Hi, my name is Hugh Malkin. I'm co-founder of Huge City. I'm uh, strategy, sales, and marketing for Huge City. I like to build things, uh, whether it be completely renovating my kitchen by myself um, or building a territory, sales territory for Phillips Lighting, um, where we quadrupled the sales in three years. I'm Matt Wilson, uh, co-founder of Huge City. Uh, I implemented the, uh, the platform and the websites. Uh, I have in the past worked for the CDC doing uh, enterprise software, including uh, emergency alerting and communications. and uh, I work for NASA doing interface prototyping for the Mars missions. Hi, I'm Jonathan Nesbitt, and I uh, built the Huge City iPhone app. Um, before that, I built websites for large healthcare organizations, and uh, before that, I built financial software for a large corporation. And we'd love to be a part of you. Thank you. Cool. Perfect timing. Okay. Any comments, questions on that one? Go ahead. Um, but I do like appreciate their like sincerity in it, and it's it came off very like um, genuine. Yeah. They're not a big idea. This is a Y Combinator video. Any other comments, questions about this one? I think one pro and con. It depends on like kind of how how it's done. Is yep. they did describe kind of their qualifications. Yep. For what it is that they're doing, but I, they didn't talk about what it is that they're yeah. doing. Yeah, in fairness, this was sort of a founder introduction, so I think it was more the founder introduction than about the project, but I yeah, completely agree with you. So the other thing to think about with these videos is sort of the production quality. One guy kind of far from the mic, one guy closer to the mic, one guy leaning back, one guy leaning forward. Um, you know, if you're going to use an iPhone, they don't have the best microphones, and we had a problem with a lot of videos last year where you could barely hear it. You had to turn the volume way up. So just make sure that you're being clear, being cool. Uh, don't be too casual, but don't be too scripted. So find that balance. Um, that's a key area. Um, so here's my elevator pitch tips. This is one of the last things. Start strong as, um, as the one project, the second project we saw. Unconscious Bias Project did. If you have a hook, if you have some way to bring the judges in immediately and get them sort of, oh, wow, this is, this is new, this is different, use that hook, use that, use that way to capture their attention. Show your connection, your commitment, your chemistry. We talked about that. Um, we liked that second video because they had that chemistry. The first team had chemistry too. The last team, I didn't sense chemistry. I sensed a lot of really bright individuals, um, but they didn't seem excited by their project, and if you're not excited by your project, the judges aren't going to be excited by your project. 
Know your audience. We talked about that in the beginning. Um, these are the judges who want to be inspired, who want to be invigorated by that student energy and hear about your really cool ideas. So use that to your advantage. Um, as we talked about with Matt um, in the first video, be genuine to who you are. If you're not a salesman, if you're more straightforward and a straight shooter, use that style. Um, that's more authentic to you. It's going to come across as more authentic to the judges. Um, and uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid is the KISS acronym everybody should know. Um, don't try and do too much. Obviously, we can't do anything with gadgetry and gimmickry and all those types of things that you can do in some videos. You want to keep everything simple, but also keep the message somewhat simple and quick um, and clear. Be conversational. We talked about this as well. If you're going to use a script, rehearse it so you don't sound scripted. I know that sounds weird, but try and avoid just throwing out a bunch of jargon, be really clear, be really authentic, um, but be conversational as well. Um, that's going to make the judges react more positively to you. And then the goal for this video, as we've talked about also up front, is leave them wanting more. Leave them wanting to really get into your proposal, dig deep into your proposal, and read every word of what you've written. Um, and practice it. Um, don't rehearse it, but practice it. Um, figure out what works best for you and your team. If you're going to be doing transitions, if you're doing this as a team, um, and I think the first project we saw, um, the Isochoric Preservation System project, they did a really good job with their transitions. They knew who was speaking when. They handed it off. They all looked to the one team member. So those transitions, work those out. If you're going to be using a microphone, make sure you're figuring out how to hand those microphones over. Just work on your transitions, practice, um, and have fun with it. Because if you have fun with it and you show that energy, the judges will like it too. This was a component we added last year, and I was a little bit apprehensive about adding it as a component to Big Ideas because I thought it could potentially influence the judges or hurt teams that don't pitch as well, but we didn't see any of that last year. Some of the teams that I thought would pitch poorly did a great job. Some of the teams that I thought would pitch really well didn't. So, um, but this is your chance to sort of sell yourself, sell your project, sell your idea, and get them excited. Okay? And it's also an element we added because um, when we did our award celebration at the end of each year, this was probably, we had a lot of our donors and our funders and people telling us that, okay, students have come up with these wonderful ideas, but they can't talk about them. Um, and so this was put into the competition specifically to give you the experience and the skills of pitching your video in a very clear way. And it can also serve you potentially as something you can use to market this project going forward. To that end, what I would say is don't mention big ideas. Um, do this as a pitch to a general audience because potentially you can use this for other audiences. Okay. So how to apply, I'm going to be sending you that link on March 2nd. That will direct you directly back to your pre-proposal application. Edit the form, upload your one single PDF, eight-page proposal with appendices. Um, upload the URL from YouTube to the application platform. Fill out our quick survey. Don't wait until the last minute because I'm sure some of you logged in at the last minute last time and realized it was a 20-minute application or 30-minute application. So get into it early. Start filling things out. Um, and don't wait till the last minute. Um, don't want to disqualify you after all this work. Um, and then that is basically it. That is everything you need to know to submit your full proposal application. And I'm excited to see what you all come up with over the next 25 days or so. Any questions, any final questions online, Mimi? Okay, any other questions from, here we go. We got one question here. Encouraged. In fact, if you have a script um, and you want me to read through your script, um, perfectly fine. If you want me to sit down there while you guys are recording it, that's what we're here for. Um, I, I actually like doing that stuff a lot, especially with the pitch videos. So come and, yeah, sound it, you know, I can be your sounding board. And if you're online, I'm happy to send, set up a Zoom call, and that's essentially a video pitch perfect format, too. One other question about the video. Is there still a rule where you are not allowed to show the innovation? Um, don't demo it. If something is sitting in front of you, an object, that's perfectly fine. But don't like pick it up and start, you know, turn the screen around and start showing them your wireframes and things like that. Any other questions? We're good?
Okay, well, good luck. We are a resource here for the next month and then well beyond that too. Networks, written proposal feedback, pitch video feedback, please call on us and uh, we're excited to see it. Thanks.